first year or two, there wasn't a lot of tears and some good arguments now and then about what we needed to do and where we were going. Um, but um, the adventure of having done it that far away from home was more than overwhelming. For one, I never at that point really thought I was going to do a gallery. And then as I tell everybody, how on earth did I dream that I was going to do a gallery and do it 9,500 miles away from home, much less. So, yeah. Already, <laughs> <laughs> Tad Anderman. Well, we missed you the first go around. You finished your show and you were heading home. <laughs> Pretty much so. <laughs> but I appreciate you coming back today to talk on uh, my sh little podcast here. How are you today? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Mark? Good. good. You survived those shows? Long week, but we always enjoy it. It's always good. Yeah, these Augusts, for those people who haven't made it out to Santa Fe, is always this crazy time that we do these Native American shows and we work 12, 14 hours a day, but you know, we got to do more than just work. We want to talk and I, there's some things I don't know about you. Now I know a little bit and I've only known you for like 25 years or so, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to find out a little bit more about you because you've done some really interesting things with your life, I think. Um, and like other, unlike other dealers, you actually have gone to different countries to try to promote Native American art, which I think is really fascinating. So, but so you grow up what Denver? Born and raised in Denver. Um, have wonderful family. Lived out in the south end of Denver, and it came grew up in Cherry Hills. And uh, that's a nice place. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't hurt. I'll have to admit <laughs> that. No, it's a, a We had a wonderful, beautiful sort of um, you know California style, very contemporary. Um, house that was uh, absolutely beautiful. We you know, had an unobstructed view of the front range of the Rockies, and uh, yeah, quite a quite a wonderful place to to start with. Yeah, and what did your dad do? What was he? My father had his PhD in geology from Princeton and had his own oil company since 1960. Is when he started out on his own. Uh, he originally started up in Gillette, Wyoming, uh, with Gulf Oil at that point. And uh, then you know, moved down to Denver around 1957 and then started on his own in 1960. So he started an oil company then on his own? Yes, he did. It would end up being called Anderman Smith Operating. It was Anderman until basically about 1975 when he took on a partner from, from Tulsa, Oklahoma and opened a second office uh, out there as well. And the whole time, though, you grew up in Denver. You stayed. He, was, he kept you there. I was in, yeah, grew up in Denver until I was about 17 years old. And then I went off to boarding school at Verde Valley School up in Sedona, Arizona for, for my junior and senior year. Yeah, yeah. So and another so, beautiful place to <laughs> say the very least. Absolutely. And so your dad was probably gone all the time, right? No, actually. I mean, it's really very surprising. Um, yeah, he uh, spent surprising. most of his time in, in Denver. I mean, my parents are extremely well-traveled. Yeah. Um, so they were out doing that, but... Yeah, dad was, family was pretty much around Denver most of the time. And you're an only child? No, I have a sister, Ellen, who's seven years older than uh, me, and uh, my brother, Evan, who's two years younger than me. Okay, so they're not, not even close to being an only child. No, so no, so stuck you have in the, the middle. <laughs> you, have that, you have the thing I have, the middle, the middle child syndrome. Absolutely. <laughs> so when you're growing up, do you remember when you first started looking at Native Arts? Oh, simple. You grew up at the Denver Art Museum. Matter of fact, Dick Kahn was over at our parents' house all the time, you know, curator at, at the Denver Art Museum and the Native Arts Department there. Um, yeah, I mean, age five, parents were already taking us on, you know, spring vacation trips down to New Mexico and Arizona, spending time up around Cayenta. I think it was probably 1969. I went to Chalico for the first time in Zuni. So, how old were you then in 69? When 69, you did I was seven years old. Okay, so, so, and that made a big, huge impression. Oh, absolutely. Had a, a lot to do with it, clearly so. Mom that collected uh, Kachina dolls and jewelry, and my father, who born and raised in Albuquerque, loved to collect Navajo rugs. So, oh, wow. So that was all around you your entire life. Absolutely how, was. How about your other siblings? Were they as intrigued with the my, culture as you were? My sister, my sister was probably the one who was more, more astute and more, more into it than my brother. My brother, um, as it goes for the Native American material, not so much so. No, not as much? Not a matter of fact, really almost very little at all. He was, he's always been more into photography his whole life. And it's his profession at this point, taking aerial photography of the Eastern Plains of Colorado from his plane, which wow. is a whole other world onto its own. Is that what he does, or is that just for his enjoyment? Well, originally, he too had it, got his <clears throat> PhD in geology like my father and started at, at, in, with, in water hydrology, 
and uh, worked with companies out in New Hampshire and that, and then eventually just went out on, on his own wanting to deal with photography and, and uh, doing it as aerial, aerial work. So, so is aerial work for his job as a geologist or is it for his no strictly as an aerial photographer yeah, so he's it, in the arts too then yes he is in the arts yeah, in that regard has with his, a phd right with a phd yeah, so a very different field for him as well but doing some beautiful beautiful work mostly trying mm. to get the landscapes uh field landscapes of of uh, eastern colorado and uh, getting some of the beautiful sort of artistic formations of how the fields are plowed and, and planted and oh i love that stuff. what's his name evan Okay, Evan. I'm yeah. going to look for him. <laughs> Where's his him. show? You can find him, Evan Anderman Photography. You'll find, right. You know, he's on Facebook. and right. other sites. shout out for you. <laughs> you may have to he, have him he, on. He, oh, you'd love having him. He's very <laughs> he's very educated, very astute individual, matter of fact. Clearly. Yeah. yeah. And Def- so let's find out about your sister. What's she doing? Ellen, my sister, um, went went to, uh, she uh, went to Phillips Exeter and, and then went on to Radcliffe at the time. Uh, she was actually one of she was in the first class at Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, and then she studied art history at Harvard Radcliffe, and she then between high school or between her co- you know high school and college and and then college after that she went and spent a year at the Cordon Bleu Cooking School in Paris, and then she spent two and a half more years in south of France, um, working under Simone Beck, who co-wrote all of Julia Child's cookbooks, mm. learning to become a master chef in France. And uh, brought those skills back to the States and did it for a couple of years and then ended up having a restaurant of her own down in Larimer Square in Denver. Um, and, and now she's just pretty much more along the lines of being very philanthropic, being on yeah. a lot of but she had her But she had her own restaurant for, for a while. For a while down in Larimer yeah. Square, absolutely. She's still in Denver? Yeah. Oh. Both my brother and sister live there oh, yeah. at Great. the moment with their spouses. So you go to Sedona your junior and senior year, right? Correct. And what did that change you being just immersed in Arizona beauty like that? Oh, Arizona has always been a phenomenal state. It's a place that my parents had taken us, you know, quite often. I mean, just spent a lot of time, most of it up in, you know, in the northeastern corner, up in the, you know, Navajo and Hopi Indian mm-hmm. reservation areas. You know, I became very familiar with it all. Yeah, the state's fabulous. Absolutely a beautiful state, top to bottom, whether you're in the desert down south or, you know, up around Flagstaff and San Francisco peaks are out of this world. Did you start collecting uh, Indian art at what period? When did you really... Do you remember your first piece, by the way? That you got? First piece? You got. Yeah. I begged... My, my dad took me to a small Navajo rug auction on South Broadway as a kid, and I remember him buying me... A, well, I bought myself along yeah. with him Navajo rug starting about age seven. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I do. Do you still have it? That one? Um, no, I don't. Matter of fact, it, yeah. it moved on somewhere. <laughs> matter of fact, but did, and from that one little rug when you were seven, did you start to collect when you were a kid? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I did a bit of it. I think part of the, the things they actually really started collecting, even though my dad was collecting rugs. Um, I really got into the, you know, the Ketsina dolls at, at that point. Um, my mom was collecting them very actively. Matter of fact, she, had a wonderful collection that ended up coming up and culminating in about 45 uh, Hopi dolls that were, she had a very specific timeline between 1910 and 1930s and, and dolls that were no, no taller than nine inches. So it was very specific what she yeah. was collecting at why, the time. Why do, you, why do you think that was, that she wanted such a specific, especially size? Um, you know, to this day, I've always asked that question. I, I don't really know whether that was the fact that they fit into a, I wonder, fr- yeah. a, you know, a French cabinet that had glass in it. Uh-huh. might have had something to do with it, but I think she just thought the conciseness of, of the pieces was something that was very alluring in its own right. Yeah, fact. so those are old dolls. So she was working with some kind of dealer. Well, I mean, to get it right. Or, yeah, I mean, basically, a lot of that at the time was like Eric Kohlberg, who had his shop in, in downtown Denver. My dad, see, I don't know who that is. So. Eric Kohlberg was one of Denver's, or probably one of the early, earliest dealers in Native American arts in Denver. He was his off his shop was in a basement about two blocks away from my father's office mm-hmm. in downtown Denver. And my, on the week, and my dad on the weekends would go down to his shop and. On a Saturday, when he put in three or four hours at the office, and he'd go over there to see what Eric had, and it was, uh-huh. and he bought his rugs from him, and right. my mom would go in there and buy the Katsina dolls from him, and Dad would find other things, and um, early on, Dad would sort of just pay out things on a, on a you know on a layaway basis with him. 
the great thing about Eric Kohlberg was he had all this phenomenal material. It was much like W.S. Dutton was in, in Santa Fe at the time. Uh, you know, very, very eclectic, very eccentric guy. But the, the case with Eric Kohlberg was he always viewed this as basically it wasn't Indian art. It was more just art. He viewed everything as artifacts. Mm -hmm. So it, had, it took on a different, different realm. Obviously, my parents knew, you know, knew what it was. My dad was born and raised in Albuquerque, and he grew up around it. My mom came out from Kansas City and you know, went to the University of New Mexico. My, my dad's parents introduced him, and that's where my mom got a hold of, uh, you know, caught the fever with the Native American Indian art, and then ended up working for galleries dealing with it in, right after she got out of the University of New Mexico oh, around she 1947, did. yeah. Oh, where did she work, do you know? I don't remember where she worked up here. I it was one of those questions I never asked her. I wish yeah. I had done so. Yeah, but, but so she worked in an Indian art gallery. Oh yeah, no, she, yeah. She'd done that up in, in Santa Fe, yeah, in the late 40s. Oh, yeah. So, it's, <laughs> yeah, it sort of bleeds over into everything. Yeah, so you're really, in, you're really around this the whole from the get-go. Positively so. And Absolutely. did you ever go down to that dealer's basement? Do you remember going oh, down there? Oh, as a kid? Yeah. yeah, a number of times. I remember going to Eric Kohlberg's shop. Absolutely. He had kept all of his rugs. I think I re the reason I remember it so well is because... Dad always wanted to look at the rugs, and all the rugs were, you know, in trunks there. Mm -hmm. And I, so he was pulling them out of trunks, and yeah, something else. That's going way back. That's yeah. quite quite a thing for me to actually sort of remember at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Can you smell it's the smell of mothballs or oh, something coming out of the? One of our favorite things, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, no. <laughs> absolutely. As a physician, maybe not mine. Right. But, absolutely. Uh, so you graduate from high school in the Sedona, right? Correct. And then where do you head out? I head directly to the University of New Mexico. And like my mom, I always wanted to go to the University of New Mexico since I was 10 years old. I knew I wanted to specifically go into anthropology. Anthropology, start with the anthropology, uh -huh. but I always wanted to be an archaeologist. Uh -huh. So, Had you done any archaeological digs? I have been with archaeological digs. I went, uh, you know, worked with the uh, Archaeological Society of, of New Mexico. Um, and I did a number of things in, out in Chaco Canyon. This mostly. was as a kid? Well, uh, yeah. Actually, around 15, 16 yeah. years old, I was doing this in Chaco Canyon, recording the, the petroglyphs and pictographs on the canyon walls, uh -huh. which we were doing. Uh, I was with Anna Sofer when we went up on Fajada Butte and identified the summer solstice. Oh, yeah. um, and wow. That, that was, I was with her and another gentleman at the time. We were given that area to go and, and check it out. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't remember me years later being a part of that group, but that's all right. I, it, was, it was a great experience. I remember going back the next year with the full team she put together of uh -huh. archaeologists and archaeoastronomists and archae, you know, all these different um, And so was that when they first came That was up? exactly when it was first found, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, 15 years old that year. Did she fact. realize what was going on at that time? Or did uh, she kind of keep it under her cuff because she didn't she, want the word out? No, she was actually a very vocal, very open person, really believed that they had what they had. As a 15-year-old kid, I was very skeptical of it then. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look down the road, you know, 10, 15 years later, most of those people sort of started distancing <laughs> herself from her and the belief of what it was. I was skeptical from word go. She, that second year that we went back with, she went back with a huge team of people. Uh, I stayed two days and left because I just didn't believe in, in what we were actually looking at at the time. And so what's the current thought on that now? Oh, uh, geez, here we are, you know, you know, <laughs> 40 years later. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think the majority of people probably don't believe it. But I mean, you know, she, you know, she built it up. She advertised it. She promoted it to a huge level. Obviously, yeah. there's videos on it. She got, you know, yeah, a lot of, the people likes go of Robert on. Redford and everyone to, uh -huh. you know, help her along with it. Um, I just don't buy into it. Yeah. I just don't I never <laughs> have. So, you know, it's just the way it is. So you go into UNM and as a anthropology major. Correct. Yeah. And so did you stay that course? I actually believe it or not. I did not. I stayed, I stayed with the department the whole time I was there, but English ended up being the thing I enjoyed more because I had really great teachers there. Yeah, no, I, mean, I mean, I think that's yeah, college, no, right? I, yeah, mean, I think it was college, You know, too. you go and you think you're going to, I thought I was going to be a research scientist, and then change within a year. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I, I always stuck with it. I mean, it's not that, you know, anthropology or, or the interest in Native American ever left me. Not at all. Matter of fact, I saw, looked yeah. and imbued a lot more of it as I went along. 
but you found these teachers that really inspired you in English. Oh, I, I just loved it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. American lit was where it was at, you know, and, and, <laughs> and you know, and, and basically, you know, Chicano literature at the time too was always a very interesting field to look at as well. And so did you get your degree in American literature or what was it? English no, you know, I didn't really finish my degree. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I basically had, you know, I, I've always wanted to go to UNM and I wrote, as I said, I wanted to be an archeologist and, the department, unfortunately, was writing on a reputation from the 50s and 60s, maybe leading into the early 70s. And by the time I got there, it, you know, being ranked, you know, like in the top five, 10 in the nation, which it was, I'd have a hard time believing it, in, you know, between 81 and 86 that uh, the t department probably could have sat in the top 20 even. Yeah. Um, it was, Eastern it, had the best one. There are a number of them <laughs> that were really good. And, you know... Um, you basically get Haverford, which is part of Bryn Mawr's campus, and the University of Pennsylvania, Arizona, Arizona State. There were a number of great schools that, you know, their departments, you know, were very, very strong, positive. So uh, any, uh, during your growing up period, did you ever paint or sculpt or do any of that? Not at person? all. I yeah. was not an artist. Yep. Didn't have those talents whatsoever. And, and still haven't done that? No, I don't think that stick figures on paper look that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're from like 1100 AD. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Positively so. So something happened during college and you, because you didn't finish, there's something else captured your attention. Um, you, you know, I really, what I really wanted to do was I really just wanted to get, you know, get involved with, with galleries. Yeah, I was headed in a direction and I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go to the, the um, Christie's Fine Arts course in London, which I had, had targeted since basically about 1980, 81. Mm. And, um, you know, I had the, uh, you know, that was very interesting process because they accept 90 students mm -hmm. and they get back then in, in 1986, um, they got 2,700 applications from around the world for those 90, 90 spots. Mm -hmm. And I was at the time I went to it. I just wanted some gallery experience on top of, of the art world I'd been around. So you were already thinking while you're in high in college, maybe I want to be a gallerist or work for a gallery or be in the art scene somehow. Oh, I clearly knew that was that was a given at that point. Yeah, and probably earlier than that. I probably I I knew that probably by the time I was already in boarding school, I was heading down that road. So kind of junior, senior in high school, you were thinking about. Oh this. yeah, definitely so. Yeah. And what was that about being in a gallery? What, did you want to own a gallery? Um, or did you not really the, know? Probably sort of mixed. I, you know, I thought about it, um, but I really thought the idea of at least getting gallery experience initially was really the most important thing that I needed to do mm -hmm. um, and, and see how it worked. So, yeah. And did your mom or dad and or both say, yeah, this is uh, you should do this. Today? I, I had parents that would encourage yeah. every all three of us in the family, all the kids to do whatever we wanted, as long as we absolutely loved where we were going and what we were doing. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, most supportive on a multitude of levels yeah and you and you think that love of maybe wanting to become a gallerist somehow had to do with those wonderful trips you did with your parents and your dad and other galleries and seeing that interaction oh clearly heightened it all yeah. absolutely positively so absolutely yeah yeah so you saw it as a very positive i want to do this so you applied to the christie's program and i'm assuming you got in I did get in. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually one of my favorite, favorite parts of it. As I, you know, I told him I, I, you know, I put in the application and I was, you know, invited out in August of, of 1986 to go to New York and they had a hotel room and they were interviewing all the prospective students yeah. there. And you're like back, 20, right? Yeah. Just, but yeah, cruising along about 24 at the time. Okay. And, uh, went in and it was it was great because you know i was sat i sat down and and uh they put these these cards in front of me and all of it was like pretty much you know european art european architecture <laughs> taking you back to you know basically rococo time and all this and that uh, looking back at it knowing that and uh, they said put these cards in chronological order of time oh, and it was like i got one of five yeah <laughs> and i'm sitting there thinking Oh, this is going to be, they're looking at me as someone who has no intelligence on, on world art. And in, maybe in some respects, I clear, clearly didn't. Um, walked out of the, I remember walking out of the interview, um, having worn a brown herringbone suit that I had that uh -huh. day and walking down the street and going, boy, I really messed up on a lot of stuff, but you know what? I'm so enthusiastic and I know where I want to go. And, um, you know, I, I, and, uh, 
felt really good about it. And at the time I was, I was work, you know, I was working for my first gallery and that was Linda Durham in San, in Santa Fe on Canyon road. And, but I had this feeling that it would work out. And, and two weeks later, I got the letter of acceptance sent to the gallery, matter of fact, uh-huh. and, uh, it went forward from there. Okay. So now how did you get to Linda Durham? So we just slided right over that. So you're 24 working at Linda Durham? Yeah. Is that your first gallery? You, yes, it was. So you applied absolutely. to it? Yeah. Um, just cold knocking. I had a list of 12 galleries in, in Santa Fe I wanted to hit. She was the ninth one, which I hit that afternoon. Huh. And she, Do you remember one through nine by any chance? Um, or even any of them? I think I, a handful of them I might remember. People like Ray Dewey, yeah. Gallery 10... Uh, we're on those lists. Um, there, gosh, I, I probably don't remember the yeah. rest of them at, per se. But it was about four o'clock in the afternoon when I walked into Linda's. You know, she's in that beautiful schoolhouse there on 400 Canyon Road, uh-huh. and uh, and she uh, invited me back for a, a second um, interview about a week later, and and took me on. And so, what were you a gallery assistant, sales? What did you do? All of it. It was great. Yeah. I got. She was. She was. She was. Uh, probably one of probably my greatest influence with the galleries period and she was one who you know really pushed me to um you know get to know her stable of artists which are new mexico abstract contemporary Mm -hmm. artists um which was really exciting i remember at the end of the first week she uh, pulled me aside one one late afternoon and said i want you to tell me who's who you think are the your favorite artists the best artists in here and and in you know basically categorize them and I, i gave her my impressions about who I thought were the best, which actually were ended, ended up being her favorite ones in the gallery as mm-hmm. well. Um, I don't think that was coincidental either. I think both of us went for extreme, you know, abstract uh, contemporary art amongst mm-hmm. the artists that, that she had. Gene Newman, uh, Timothy App, Richard Hogan, the likes of those those artists that were there who were really exceptional. Yeah, she did cutting edge stuff. Oh, hardcore, yeah. yeah. Rick Dillingham's pots, things right. along those lines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Is she, she moved to Galisteo or she was, yeah, she moved to right. Galisteo when I was there. Um, when I went to work for her, she was living in the basement of the gallery. Yeah. So yeah, it takes it back a little bit. Yeah. So were you the only, uh, person working with her? Oh no, she had a, she had a director, Sue Scott, and she had, um, three other part-time. Yeah. So uh, she was pretty much cooking it. Oh, big time. And this is like what? 86? <laughs> this like? was 1984, 85. Yeah. So you worked for her for two years. I, for about a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And did you think when you left her place going to Christie's that maybe that was going to be more your field was modern art versus native American art? Cause you had this influence when you're a young kid. No, I don't think so. But you know, I grew up with a family. I mean, I discussed all that about, you know, native American, but our family was hardcore into contemporary art always had been heavy involvement with the Denver art museum growing up as a kid. Mm-hmm. So, um, I love both fields. But and you lived in a more contemporary home, didn't you? Extremely contemporary. Yeah, for home. that time, especially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fabulous but, house. But and even growing up with the, in that house, you had native arts and then you had very contemporary art? We had a great mix of everything. Yeah, and yeah. that was, you know, um, not, it's hard, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we, you know, we had wonderful, great pieces of sculpture in the, in the yard. My dad preferred, you know, abstract sculpture. Um, yeah, we had, you know, some of the great... Uh, abstract, you know, artists from the '40s, '50s, '60s wow. in the house, uh, mixed up with all the, with all of the, uh, the Native American. Actually, the biggest part of it, though, really became the family's love and passion for, from you know, for art from Papua New Guinea, which our family got immersed in. I guess mm. is, a, is an understatement. Yeah, because uh, they went to Papua New Guinea. Yeah, my father did eleven trips there um, between 1975 and 1991. Um, I was lucky enough to go on on two of those trips. My brother and sister went on four of those trips. Mm. My mom was on on three of those trips. I went in 1977 and again in 1983. Mm. And so he was there for business and buying, or just no? Buying? He, my dad fell in love with Papua New Guinea. Oh wow! Just so he big just, time. We had yeah. we had a really great guide that my parents met their first trip in '75. Um, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Liver said she was an Australian expat. And my da- and his good friend was a native who came out of the village of Washcook on the Middle Sepik River, Cosby, Merrick, and uh, the two of them took us as our guides through every one of the the uh, the trips, eleven trips. 
Wow. And they were buying up. We were buying an art in, in, in all the villages. Historic uh, and contemporary? Well, you get in the villages, most of it doesn't, you know, with that kind of climate doesn't last that long. But we did find pieces that, that dated up to probably 120 years. But mostly it was just the pieces that we purely liked, yeah. uh, you know, so. What they were making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, when this uh, all culminated, we ended up with a family collection of about 1,100 pieces of Papua New Guinea art. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and does the family still have this collection? We had the collection up until my father passed away in 1995. And, it, and what it was set up was that we, um, we were had, um, we were handing over the bulk of the collection to the Denver Art Museum with their with their permission to sell off what they didn't want. So mm -hmm. they weren't stuck having to house and, and store right. it all, keep what they wanted. But my mom had put together a very elaborate plan on how the family could pick pieces and then hand the rest of the collection over. And so we all went through sort of this rotation pick and each of us took uh, 25 pieces from the collection that weren't our own. Um, and the rest went to the, went to the museum. So you still have a love for that art? I love it. I always will love it. Do I have them? Do I keep a lot of mine? No, it was a lot. I, I ended up with about 85 pieces on my own. Oh, yeah. um, and lot. today I probably got about maybe 35 or 40 yeah. of them. Yeah, still. So you still have a lot. Yeah. A fair yeah. amount. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's never lost on us. It's in our blood too. So Linda, the letter comes to Linda Durham gallery from Christie's. She knows you're going to blow pretty quickly. Yeah. What did she say when she saw the letter? She so was, <laughs> and why easy, did you? Easy. And why did you send it to the gallery? Because probably at the time I was living up in San, here in Santa Fe temporarily at the at the time. I mean, obviously we're yeah. working for her, and I, I had it addressed there. Easily my biggest supporter. And yeah. I mean, my family was too, but she she was the one. Who, she knew I, why I was working for her. It was to you know get gain the experience so that I could put in this application and and, and go forward with mm -hmm. it and. Uh, yeah, it was a fantastic deal. So you left for, for Christie's, and that's what, like a, a, a year? year-long course, yeah. yeah. And so you're in New York, and that's the first time you've lived on the East Coast like that? No, at the course uh, the course was in South Kensington, London. Oh, even so better. So I got to spend the year in London. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And what did you take away, and what did you learn from that trip, from that um, experience? Well, let's put it this way. The, the first half year, I had n no... I had a very poor understanding of, of world art compared to what I thought I, I right. knew. Um, right. It was it's so funny. I think it becomes sort of very regionalized in, the, uh, in respects to heavy on New Guinea, heavy on contemporary, heavy on Native American, and uh, very little on the rest of the world. Right. Now you're experiencing the Tate and, and all that goes with it. Oh, the great thing about the Christie's Fine Arts course is that we're all given badges with, you know, unfettered access to all the auction houses and the, the ability and rights to pick up and, 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 and deal with pieces. Obviously, we had the Tate, you know, the British Museum, the Victorian Albert, mm -hmm. um, you know, anytime we wanted access to any of it, we had it. Yeah. Which was really just a, you know, it was a great place to learn. And so you graduate from that. I got out of there. Yeah. And then do you work for Christie's or what? No, happens no. I, uh, I came, I came straight back to New Mexico and, and in 1987, I went to work for Alan Anthony at the Adobe gallery in Albuquerque. Yep. So you had this training and did you realize after that a year in Christie's you go, well, maybe this isn't really, I don't want to do this kind of art. No, I knew I was coming back knowing yeah. what I wanted to do. And that was going back, was going into Native yeah. American. Yeah. So you had a boondoggle, enjoyed all of Christie's learn. Yeah, had That's a fun it. time with yeah. it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very so. good. And so how did you get in with Al? How, how did that happen? You know, I knew Al in his gallery when I came to the University of New Mexico in 1981. And my parents in 1980, I mean, Al started in basically late 78, 78. 79. 70, yeah. Yep. And I interviewed him a couple of days ago, by the way. Right. And so I'm fresh up on Al's <laughs> history. One of the most wonderful gentlemen, yeah. one of the greatest learning experiences in my life. Um, but my parents went in there in 1980. They happened to be there, uh, mm -hmm. visiting family. And my parents bought, uh, I mean, my mom and dad bought a Manuel V. Hill Nascimento set from him. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. I remember them bringing it and being in the house and asking where it was. And a year later, I obviously go down to school at the university and went in there and bought another Manuel V. Hill Nascimento set. And then um, I think somewhere during my college days, I bought yet another one. Mm -hmm. And um, always in incredibly enamored with the material that he had in the gallery. 
And in 1987, I went in and applied for a job and, um, or maybe it was late eighties. Well, you know, it was when I got back from, from, uh, Christie's mm -hmm. and he had, you know, Brent still working for him as you knew. And, um, then Brent left and I have to, happened to just go back and ask him again down the road and he, he hired me on. So I ended up staying there from 1987 to 1990. Yeah, so three years. And yes. what, what did you learn in that period from Al? Oh, my gosh, what <laughs> didn't I learn? Yeah. You know, the best thing that he did for me to start with was, you know, we, you know, it was a really height of the Native American work is, you, you know, the galleries and things yeah. were really flying high. So we were watching a lot of material come in and out. And I'd spend that first year, year and a half, six of eight hours a day, literally in the back room, packing pottery and shipping it out, learning to ship and learning to pack correctly was probably one of the greatest things that could have happened to mm -hmm. me. Um, it's not a matter of sales and that, and I mean, yeah, that's, it, it's, that's important clearly, but learning how to deal with the material physically, um, was just a, a, you know, extremely great trait to have. Yeah. Cause you continue to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and I mean, I love, you know, as it goes, I love retail. I love uh, working with people. I've always been around people my whole life. I like that, that kind of setting. So being able to do sales uh, was, was pretty much automatically second nature for me as well. Yeah. So you enjoyed the sales component. Oh, live for it. Yeah. It oh, was great. I bet it, Al loved that. <laughs> oh, no, it was great. You know, you know, I started consigning into his gallery uh, material my own, which he allowed me to do. Um, you know, Al's very stat driven on a lot of things. So uh -huh. he tell you, well, you know, you have these, you know, you buy, you know, consign these pieces in on average, they were selling within 45 days. Here was your profit margin. Yeah. Here are the things going. Um, you know, the point in which about a year, year and a half, two years in, um, you know, the, the percentage of sales that I was making for the gallery as a whole, um, was really good. I think another thing that Al did that was really good in disciplining me was, um, you know, every morning, as you know, he'd sit down and write three to five letters or more with photographs back then, put yep. in those, you know, trying, you know, sent off to his clients. And he, uh, he got me into doing that it was part of my prerequisite every uh -huh. day too, of getting at least two or three out. The, Eng myself. the English background helped then. Yeah, I think I would say it was, <laughs> it, was it helped, helped along the line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And for those who don't know, a long time ago, we used pen and paper to write things. I still oh. do it. I'm pretty primitive. <laughs> <laughs> and, we did, and we didn't have any digital photos that we could attach or anything. So we had to get things printed and put onto the... I am, I am not computer savvy like, like you, Mark, or the great job that Al has done as well with his gallery. Yeah, no, he's done a very good job. Fabulous. Thing. Indeed. But you have a website. so We have a website. Yeah, yeah so definitely. We'll, so. And we'll get into that as sure. well. So you leave Al's... In what, 80... 1990, ninety March of nineteen ninety, roughly, yeah. And so what was it? Did you realize at that point you go, I've got to, I can maybe do this on my own? I Positively like so. Yeah. yeah, I would, I, I mean, it makes sense. You've right, been doing absolutely. it. You're, you're succeeding. You're clearly doing well. Right. And so what did you think you were going to do? Um, doing it, basically everything I did today, the, the big, the big <clears> thing <throat> that, that factored in wasn't just Native American Indian art, but about a year before... I left Al's. I met through him a very good friend of his, John Durant, who was an expat living down in San Miguel de Allende, who mm -hmm. had a phenomenal eye for Mexican primitive colonial furniture and Mexican folk art. And that kind of stuff I, I also knew pretty fair, fairly well when I was already working for Al. Mm -hmm. um, and John got me you know, very interested in that. So I was doing a lot of buying primarily the, the Mexican primitive furniture, which to this day I still love. Mm -hmm. uh, Were you, did you go down to Mexico and start buying? Or? I bought pieces down there, but a lot of it I was buying through other dealers at the border and things that were coming up. Mm -hmm. Initially, when I met John, John, in, you know, that same year that I went out on my own, moved up to Albuquerque, and um, I bought all the furniture out of his house from San Miguel. So I started off yeah, so with you, 84 yeah. pieces of furniture to begin with. Right. And so, and so where did you open your gallery? Where did I open the gallery? Yeah. Well, that fast forwards us to a you okay. know, way, way up. To, okay. So to, let's don't fast forward. So you get leave Al's. Yes. And you're going to start selling on your own. So you're doing this kind of buying and selling on your own, that just kind of out of your house type of thing. Completely. So yeah, absolutely. And this, um, carries on until 
2010 when I when I so moved. You, so you leave in 1990, Al's? Yeah, I leave Al's in 1990. and I, So for the next 20 years, you buy and sell? On my own. On that is own. correct, yeah. And why do that versus not getting a gallery? Because you like retail and you like um, seeing people. Probably was wasn't sure that I was ever ready or feeling that I really wanted, wanted to, you know, that idea sort of went by the wayside compared to earlier days. Um, I was happy enough with the freedoms I had, probably not as disciplined as I could have been. Mm-hmm. Um, there it but, is, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's a little easier if you don't have to open at nine. And no, absolutely. So. There was times later on, I go, gosh, I wish it was turnkey and I could go, you know, at five o'clock, shut my head and the gallery yeah. off and, and go in it, you know, but um, no, it was really good. And, uh, you know, it gave me a freedom to go out and, and, and look around and, and, you know, find things as well. So, yeah, yeah, but that's a harder route, I think, personally. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, because you have to develop clients. Yeah, that is correct. And so you started doing the shows like the, the White Hawk Show and Marin Show and that kind of stuff, um, or not really so much? It was sort of a mix of things. Those first couple of years, I I really enjoyed going to those handful of shows that were out in in Washington, D.C. that we were doing back then. Um, They are sort of lost in the mix. And then as it goes for shows in New Mexico, I I got involved with Robert Delgadio's show over at the El Dorado, you know, in that sort of mid-early 90s time frame and that was and, at the hilton at the hilton yeah. and yeah and and that one and then he moved it over to the el dorado and it was um it got a flavor for it it was sort of it was a lot of fun you know and, and at the time i was really starting to acquire some um really good material I was starting to head more over towards uh you know the jewelry although pottery was still my my favorite thing at that point yeah so that 20 year period that you left you primarily focused on Historic Pueblo pottery. Correct. Some furniture and Mexican material. Oh, the Mexican primitive furniture was always there. Yeah. Absolutely. But, and at some point, you really got into jewelry because that's kind of almost, I would think, your thing. Yeah. The jewelry, uh, pretty much hand in hand with it, but I'd say probably it, it took off probably about three or four years later, around 1994, 93, 94. Uh, really got into it, and I was very specific about what I wanted. I was really locked in on bracelet, you know, the old pawn bracelets at that point. Yeah, and what was their criteria? Like your mother, did they have to be six inches tall in nineteen ten to nineteen thirty? Or actually, I understand I, now how you collect things. No, I, actually, I get no, it now. And it, it's probably you know not not that being being cognizant of it, but you bringing it up. Yeah, it was because uh-huh. I was I w- had immediately locked in that you know pre nineteen thirties bracelets going back to the eighteen seventies uh-huh. um, were really quite quite desirable yeah. to say the very least. So that really you focus and how do you learn about that? I mean that's really I mean part of it the internet comes on, but part of it's no internet. I think it was finding and being subjected to the right mentors that that introduced me into that that field of jewelry, um, I feel. Um, I hope I'm not too arrogant, but I feel I have a very very good eye for material. No, and you th- do, and I think yeah. that's based off of the fact that I've looked at a lot of material. Uh, I think I think I'm, it has to do with the fact you grew up around it, you true. studied it, you went to Christie's. You know, it's right. clearly you. You know, you have a joy for this material. Yeah, I think that, and I think one of the things that was really good was getting mentors to have me, you know, help me along. But it was also having a photographic memory for what I'd seen at, at you know, at shows, in galleries, mm-hmm. in museums, in books, and being able to correlate pieces with with other pieces I'd seen in other places. Yeah, definitely. It does seem that people who do excel in our profession have a good memory for objects. Oh, clearly so. Yeah. Absolutely. And so who were some of the mentors that would have helped you in the jewelry, learning the jewelry? The jewelry is yeah, specifically Mark Cooper. Hmm. Mark lived, uh, literally, I could pick up a rock. He lived on, lived on the street across from me, um, and I could throw a rock and probably hit his house from it. And I think when I le- left, even before I left Al's in 1989, I'd go, I'd go over and visit with Mark every afternoon. Um, and Mark, I'd see what he'd pick through the pawn shops and the antique shops mm-hmm. and, and people in, in Albuquerque. And so every day I was getting to see, you know, the fresh material that he w- had collected and what he had. And, and uh, the great thing about Mark also was he'd always explain things very well to me. And if I didn't understand it, he would continue to explain until mm-hmm. I did understand what I was looking at and what I was seeing. 
Um, but clearly, he gave me the eye and the direction for the jewelry. No he question. He still does that, right? Very much yeah. so. Very has much. He, so. Has he changed his the way he does things? You know, is he still just? No, it's very much the same thing. Yeah. You know, he moved out of Albuquerque and lives outside of Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah, you know, he's still doing the very much the same yeah. thing yeah. today. Absolutely. <laughs> he and Bobby Bober went to UNM together. Yeah. they're best of friends, and Bobby's another one that I, you know, whose opinion. I, you know, value extremely highly. Yeah, no, the yeah. guy knows his work for yeah. sure. There's no doubt about it. I need to get him on the show. Yeah. Mark a- is every bit as well-versed. Most people just don't know him as uh-huh. well. But Mark's knowledge is just phenomenal. So you get into the jewelry, and so that's sort of your billywig then, is jewelry, pottery. It still is, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. positively, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And so in 2010 is your first, you had a gallery before then though. No. I thought I never, you tried one, one for a short period of time somewhere. No, no, no. I, I'm no. sorry. You know who that was? Mm-hmm. Eric Phillips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric decided he didn't like no, it. No, absolutely. Eric's a wonderful gentleman too. <laughs> Love Gotta him. get Eric on yeah. there too. So in 2010 is when you decided to do something different. It started on December 5th, 2009. Okay. I, uh, it actually, maybe it was started two months earlier, uh, Jennifer Cullen, who has four winds gallery out in Sydney, Australia. And I knew her on the, you know, on a very minimal basis. She'd been in my booth at a couple shows in Santa Fe and this and that. And she bought, you know, just a mere handful of pieces from me at that time. Didn't really know her. Mm-hmm. And, um, in October, 2010, I got an invitation for her 50th birthday and in, in Sydney. And I thought, God, that's. And I found out there were like 10 people in the States who got invitations. And I thought, Mm -hmm. well, it's sort of entertaining and uh, sort of a wild person at that time and probably more undisciplined than I'd been in a while. And uh, it was literally about a a week before that date I just mentioned, the 5th of December. Mm -hmm. I was thought I would... (laughs) And I just had broken up with someone and I, and I was sitting there in front of my computer one night drinking some red wine. And I thought, what the hell? I'm not doing anything for Christmas. Let's, let's just go out. And I'll go to this birthday party. Right. And so I went out into that birthday party, um, surprised Jennifer to no end, brought some pieces out for her to put on consignment. And um, it was very interesting because she, at the end of the party that night, she... Um, invited me to go out on one of her friend's boats in, in Sydney Harbor and, and spend the, the afternoon uh, trolling around Sydney Harbor. And we were about an hour into tour, you know, going around the harbor, just had passed the Sydney Opera House. And she turned and asked me if I would be interested in going to work for her and her gallery. Mm. And I said, you know, I'm in the right place and space at the moment where you know, I think I do that. I just need a couple months to figure out if I can organize my life and then make the move down to uh, Sydney. And I end up calling her the end of February. We'd set a deadline of March for the decision and uh, went ahead and did so. Went down and checked everything out in March of 2010, just one more time. And on the 27th of May, 2010, I had moved to Sydney. And so how long had she been selling Native American jewelry? She opened her gallery in 1981. She was. I didn't know it was that long. She, oh uh, you know, her family had moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 79. She went to the University of Pittsburgh for a couple of years. Her father was working, I believe, for, I think it was probably the steel industry, I'm don't, but don't quote me on that. Um, and she uh, started working for John Crana. And that's where she got her bug, her bug with this whole thing. And, uh, She's done extremely well with her gallery. And John did some kind of um, franchise type of thing at that time? No. She took John's name, his gallery name, and, uh, you know, John didn't, for the most part, I don't think had a problem with that. And, and uh, she was four wins down there. She was on her own. Yeah. Um, she had a very, a very good eye for what she was looking at and almost all of it was specifically jewelry in her case mm-hmm. and still to this very day um she ran a very beautiful gallery i mean she and she had you know a, a total monopoly she was the only gallery that was doing that in all of australia and uh, you know i give her high praise for taking you know an art that hadn't been seen by the australians mm-hmm. and promoting it and doing an extraordinary job with it and primarily jewelry is it what she oh, has? Oh yeah, she was she. I mean, she had other things in the gallery. You know, she had you know lithographs and and rugs and that. But uh, you, like me, her she you, you know, vast majority of of everything that was being done in the gallery was strictly jewelry. And that's what people can understand. That that's what the 
the client base in Australia really Yeah, is. the women ate it up. You're talking yeah. 90, 95% of her clientele being women in wow. there. Um, and she opened that in 81? In 1981. Wow, I had no idea yeah, that was no, really. Well, we got to get her on now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> She'll, She'll be take a good one. time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, so you go over there in 2000. Now this is 2010, right? Correct. And you're going to work for her. Right. And what was it like to be in Australia? Um, You know, I'd been in Australia before and our okay. trip's going to Papua New yeah, Guinea. Yeah, I figured as um, much. But it's... Yeah, it was a it, for me. It was a really just a fresh start. I was breaking from things that had been, you know, a lot of the same here. And not that I didn't enjoy what I was doing here. Um, I thought it was um, a, a new lease on life. The the Australians were um, very interesting people. They're um, you know very upbeat. They're very happy. They're they're pleasant people. They're very conservative. Um, I, I, they're they're very it's it's sort of hard to define them because they, they're, they're, they're and it's being such an isolated country as mm -hmm. they are. Um, they they confine themselves to, you know, a very restricted sort of, um, worldview worldview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's very yeah. true. More, yeah. they're more concerned with Australia maybe. Yeah. Oh, clearly locked in on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh huh. And, but did you enjoy that? I mean, cause you stayed for a while. Yeah, exactly. End up being there till, you know, we closed the gallery in 2017. Um, you know, our gallery when we started in, in yeah. So how long did you work for her before you said, maybe I should try this myself? I was with her for a very short period of time. I was with her for just about five months and that was about it. Yeah. And then you realized maybe I can just do this on my own. Um, yeah, I think that had some to do with it. I think I, I had a, I, you know, there were different directions in which I was going at the time. And uh, so I, I sort of, I left the gallery and hung around there uh, with a good friend of mine, someone I was dating at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and we sat down in the first of the year in 2000, January, 2011. And, um, by February, 2011, we decided we were going to commit to a gallery. I see. And you start, and so that's when silver plume blossomed. Yeah. We changed out the name and went from silver plume trading, which I had in the States to silver plume gallery over there. Yeah. And so the silver plume that relates to the Avanu or is, tell so, us about that. Silver plume comes from the town of silver plume, Colorado, which is about 60 miles outside of Denver on okay. I 70. My mom and dad had a beautiful Victorian house there in the town it used to be the second largest silver mining town in colorado mm. in the 1870s and 80s outside of leadville um very tiny town up at 9100 feet and we as kids we used to ski all the time because mm -hmm. we had a basin and mm -hmm. keystone and all the areas right around there and i decided uh i took the, my name from the town and, and the town had a big, a big affinity because mm -hmm. my mom ended up in 1970 uh, with a friend of hers and then buying him out literally at one point owned 65 percent of the buildings in the town that she was retrofitting and restoring mm. um and so the town had a played a big part of my life and our our lives so, so do you do you have to say that do you have to do this story every time when somebody asks you about silver? no i don't or do you I just say no, it's an old mining no, town and no no no, I'm, no. I, I'm just one who likes to fill in detail and it's probably <laughs> probably too much but yeah it's sort of where it all came from yeah but you have an avanu for a, a logo kind of thing no right? we did not matter of fact i took the logo that's on my card is yeah. very abstract and what it is it's an abstract uh depiction that um a lady by the name of jenny debrook who did a lot of my mom's mm. work who was an architect um Designed for my father's business, which is just you know making a, a fraction or not a fraction, but a fracture in in, in the geological landscape, mm, okay. and and uh, it was my dad's logo, and I applied it to Silver Plume Gallery. Oh, very cool. So you opened that in 2010, 2011, 2011. We, we pretty much had things in place by June, but really August was where uh, where we really formally opened the gallery in 2000. And your partner was Australian. No, Vicky, my partner, um, was for, is originally from New Zealand, oh. and but had lived the last at uh, that time the last twenty five years in Australia. And it wasn't a pro so it wasn't a problem for you to be because you're not an Australian resident, right? To have a no, gallery. there yeah. was no yeah, yeah, wasn't a problem. Okay, and so how did it go? Um, I think like anything, you know, you, you, you want to project out and for galleries to be successful and Al Anthony and others would tell you, and then you would clearly know yourself the first five years, it's a Tough. serious investment. You yeah. know, you don't really see anything from it. If you can succeed and get out of that five to seven year time frame, 
you start seeing the clientele build. You start right. finally, you know, recoup, I think that's right. recouping everything. And uh, that was it. There wasn't like, it wasn't like the first year or two, there wasn't a lot of tears and some good arguments now and then about what we needed to do and where were we going. Right. Um, but um, the adventure of having done it that far away from home was more than overwhelming. For one, I never really, at that point really thought I was going to do a gallery. And then as I tell everybody, how on earth did I dream that I was going to do a gallery and do it 9,500 miles away from home, much less. So, yeah, well, yeah. and it's a tougher sell, too, because you've got to educate everybody of what we, you're doing. We had to educate our own clientele. We we're the second gallery in the country that was doing this. Um, and it was a formidable challenge. Yeah, yeah I would say. I mean, I would. My first move would be <laughs> aboriginal art would be yeah. added very quickly which we did have and that was vicky's expertise because yeah, she I mean, came from that's... a gallery that that was totally devoted to that for for 20 years so she brought that element to the gallery as well and did that do better than the native material or no was... actually not because what we did and she was i think she was correct and it's sort of the line of logic that i use with with indian art which is um harder to make sales, but it's better to sell really high end material. And so we carried about three to five pieces of Aboriginal art in our gallery, but we were dealing with the very best mm. of the Aboriginal artist pieces. Yeah, so, right. um, and I, 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 I'm glad we, you know, went, use that formula actually to go. Were these through. living artists? Some of them, most of them were still living. It's, it's sort of interesting. They were, you know, for their age, um, number of those that we we're carrying literally were, were dying off at the time we were carrying their, their work but yeah how do you get that kind of material um vicky had really good contacts she knew private collections she um and was it knew that some of these people were were parting with some of their collections mm. and so we were we were in the right place at the right time really yeah. So you do that through 2000 and what, 18? We did the gallery, the physical gallery through March of 2017. 17. Yeah. Yep. And then at some point you go, okay. Well, I think what happened was we saw the economic climate of Australia the last year we were there. And it's sort of sad because we, here we are, you know, in seven, you know, basically seven years in at that point, we had, we got past that threshold right. of the five years. The sixth year, the fifth and sixth year were really great. In the seventh year, we watched the Australians uh, get really conservative, worried about their economy, even though it really hadn't changed. Was, they're very sensitive. With the wind blows wrong, the Aussies mm. shut down buying everything. Mm. That's just the, their mentality. And mm -hmm. uh, we had um, from basically um, the end of 2016 going into 2017 the sales had dramatically dropped we weren't seeing as many people in it was uh they were getting very tight and conservative and even though we had finally you know got to where we wanted to we weren't still a strong enough gallery to probably weather what we were seeing and we mm -hmm. were we made the right call um i would have loved to continue to be there clearly um but it was um we got out we didn't we didn't lose um and, but, you know, the great thing is we realized that we had the clientele, that we established it, mm -hmm. and uh, we, Vicky had done a, ex, has done an extraordinary job with our website. And so we, to this day, we continue forward with it. Yeah, and that's silver, silverplumegallery.com? Gallery. It's silverplumegallery.com.au. .au, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you better throw that one in. Yeah. I'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in there. <laughs> yeah, so she continues to handle the website, and, you can, and now you're the back in America doing your thing in America. That is correct, but the thing is, what, we've got a unique, um, you know, we've got a unique system that we're using, which is, um, everything, everything I buy, mm -hmm. um, I ship out to Vicki. Um, it's, she photographs it for the website. Uh, it's going to set. And what, what we do is at least as recently as these last two years is we feel an obligation to our Australian clients to show them the material mm -hmm. or most of it first off, because, mm -hmm. um, they've been extremely good to us and mm -hmm. they, uh, we really appreciate it. But we, you know, we show them the material at pretty much exactly the same time we put it on the website and what they buy, is, you know, it's fabulous and great. Um, but what's not sold, um, you know, it's a big portion of it obviously all comes back to me. And basically we, you know, I curate it here. Mm -hmm. So that's so where, you find it. 
she kind of sells it over there. And if she doesn't sell it, it comes back to you and you sell it. Yeah. There's still pretty much equal opportunity for those in the States, but we, there's a handful of clients that we really, mm -hmm. you know, we still cater to, I guess is a good way to put it. Yeah. Do absolutely. you, do you feel, I mean, you have, I think as good an insight as anybody that is there a market for native American art in places like Australia, New Zealand, these areas that, very very much yeah. so uh, more so than most people would think yeah. i give all the credit to jennifer for, for having established that market over there i mm -hmm. mean clearly if as it goes for the southwest native american material she was the one who brought it to australia um and she did an extremely good job with it and um yeah she's yeah. very knowledgeable if she's very <laughs> she's knowledgeable and she did a you know she is really in, you know, deserves the credit for, you know, having introduced it to Australians. Yeah. And does she, is she on the only open gallery in Australia for native American art at this time? There is a handful of galleries that in, in, in Sydney and maybe a, a handful in, in Melbourne that I'm aware of, but you know, they're not solely devoted to it. It's, it's, you know, it's just a, a small part of what mm -hmm. they have as it goes for, you know, absolutely being, strictly devoted to native american art yeah she is she is it yeah and then along with us having doing what we're doing now and so now you're back here in the states you do shows you do private people can find you on your web and, and go see you privately you're back in your element like you, where you like to be yeah i think so at the moment <laughs> yeah clearly clearly so yeah absolutely <laughs> now there's one thing we haven't discussed and i want to talk about it before in this is your love of hopi tiles yes or should i say your addiction to hopi tiles your yeah. <laughs> i would say i'm immersed in them yeah. yeah absolutely so for those people who may not know what we're talking about a hopi tile just kind of define what you collect like your nine inch kachinas mm -hmm. you have collected hopi tiles very similarly to your mother now yeah. i totally get this by the way yeah no and you're probably the one who's tying it all together better than i am <laughs> but yeah i, I was I was six years old, uh, you know, parents that were very heavily involved at the Denver Art Museum. Six years old, I'd go up to the Native American Indian art section because I'd, you know, I'd seen the material in our house. And there was a display of 60 Palaka, Hopi Palaka tiles that were always on permanent display. And and these, just so people know, were made for the tourist trade. They were they made were, for, Yeah, and correct. they're squares, just like they they're say squares, usually. They're uh, squares, six by four. The original early tiles were 11 by five, 10 by 10 that... Thomas Keem had in his, you know, his shop there in, in Keem's Canyon and at Hopi. Um, but these 60 tile were amazing. And the Denver Art Museum, as we know, has the biggest collection. They got 310 of these Palaka tiles. And I just fell in love with the imagery. Of course, you got Katsina imagery, just like the Katsinas that were at home mm -hmm. in my, my parent, my mom's collection. But the fact that they were on tile, absolutely awed me and i've always liked them always wanted one mm -hmm. and i um i always you know i always kept an eye out and, and observed them and in 1970 i was on a spring vacation here in santa fe and i went into ws dutton's and there were probably about 40 of them in the case hmm. and i ran back to the la fonda hotel where my parents were saying I said you got to buy me these things you just got and they looked at me like what are you talking about you know right. this is just how old it, are you now I was eight years old at oh, the time, God, yeah. and um, I didn't get any. Yeah, they, they didn't. They didn't buy. I, they went over there and looked at them with me, yeah. but they didn't buy them. And um, what would a tile cost back then? Do you back know? then, we were looking at one two hundred dollars a tile. Yeah, okay. Um, and I, yeah, I specifically remember that as well. Always had an affinity. Never, it never backed off. This was something that that was I was going to see through. And at age fifteen, Santa Claus put two of them in front of my stockings. Mm -hmm. And Santa must have picked them up from Eric Kohlberg there in Denver, is my yeah. guess, you know. And uh, so that started that started the collection there, um, yeah. and it it blossomed out from there. Um, it's been one of the great things that I've done. Where yeah. currently, um, if you fast forward a little bit, I'm at 167 Palaka tiles, specifically Palaka. Right. I've been offered Acoma, Hamus, Zia tiles. Um, do they have to be Palaka or can they be Hopi as well? Or do they no, have... they have to be Palaka. Yeah, so Palaka just refers to the, right. to the, the time frame. Yeah, the case. time frame. And right. also the construction because they have a crazing that you see right. in the slip. Positively so. so. Yeah. yeah. And they're earlier. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, taking them back, the tiles, that you know, the earliest Palaka tiles are recorded back to 
December of 1882, uh, the ones that Victor Mendeleff had picked up at Thomas Keem's on his Smithsonian trip out there. Yeah, so so we, Keem's had the trading post. Keem had and, the trading post, exactly. And yeah. uh, so we, you know, I'm able to, through my research I've done over the years on them, as you're well aware of, um, to, to follow through with where, the, where these have gone. Um, and uh, yeah, and take it up to about 1910, you know, 1915, you watch the crackleware slip go, you know, go, mm -hmm. go away. A few of them, I think, overlaps. You know, like there's, sure, there's I'm theories sure about, you know, the slips changing. Um, had those discussions with people, you know, in the business as well, right. too. But yeah, it's, it's the biggest private collection there is yeah, that's sure assembled. That. <laughs> um, the next closest that I know of is probably about 45 in mm -hmm. someone's collection. Uh, if you put it in, uh, you know, as it goes, it's the third largest collection overall outside of the Denver Art Museum and the Peabody Museum's collection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good 60 plus tile bigger than the one that the, you know, the Museum of Northern Arizona uh, has and, you know, a couple other museums that are uh, that I've visited as well. Do we know how many even have a sense of how many tiles might have been made? No idea about how many are made. I have a good sense of how many I've seen and I can identify with it are strictly Palaka, and we're, we're probably hitting a number that's, you know, just a little over 2,000 mm -hmm. at best mm -hmm. that are still in existence that I'm aware of. Yeah. And Nampeo would make these too, right? She did indeed, yes. And there were the wonderful tags that were put on the backs of these tiles, and, and some of them um, not only were attributed to her, they definitely were her work with, mm -hmm. the, with her own tags on them. Yeah, and we all look for those little Hopi tags on the back. From, Very from much team. so. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything else you want to share? Any other passions I don't know about? Yeah. I, for a number of years from age five until about eight years ago, collect Naga hide dolls. I don't even know what a Naga hide doll is. They were made by Uniroyal as a promotion. They looked like these sort of little owl monster figurines that were, you know, out of, um, what is the what is the material um it'll catch naga me. Hide. yeah there's it is there's your naga hide yeah um but yeah i collected those and then sold off that collection i've collected a number of different things over the years and, and done things like that yeah <laughs> so it's it's that um you know I, it's it's pretty fun i think travels you know got me in, interested in a whole lot of different things clearly we're very fortunate to come from a family that that did a lot of traveling yes. so and collecting yes. clearly and collecting clearly yeah. do your other siblings your other brother and your sister do they have the same kind of genetic defect that you and i have yeah my brother you know not just being a photographer but loves to heavily collect photography so yeah, yeah he he's he's done that um my sister loves collecting art and but hers is you know a, a wide array of different forms yeah. of art as well um she has uh had a pretty strong affinity with some african art as well uh, but the whole family uh, has always been really locked in on New Guinea and locked in on, you know, abstract contemporary art. It's always been a big yeah. part of mid-modern furniture has been a big, very big part of, yeah. of in my upbringing. Well, you and I both like Nakashima furniture. Oh, the so. Nakashima is great. You know, you know, the Wagner material, you know, the right felt, you know, yep. pieces like that, um, you know, um, along those lines and other artists too. Yeah. Do you see the business changing in the last 10 years have you noticed changes in what you know you're able to buy sell yeah interest? I, think, I think as you would well know i think it's very difficult for us these days to find the really great old pawn um just older material in general um i think we've seen some uh, you know i think one of the things is we you know our crowd of of, of clientele has gotten a lot older so um i'm not so sure we're selling to the same volume we used to mm -hmm. to them um i have some serious concerns about where we are i think one of the, one of the things that we haven't done um is bring um a fair amount of new blood in and uh, into the business in regards to um younger dealers mm -hmm. and getting them involved in what we're what we're about and what we're doing in this in this wonderful you know wonderful industry that we're a part of um and i think that um not being overly critical but i believe that we um as a group need to seriously uh take a look at where we're at and and consider doing a lot more advertising not just in its individual galleries and owners but mm -hmm. maybe as groups this is something that i've had conversations with with gosh i, I took this conversation back once with merrill domus probably 20 25 years ago mm -hmm. and uh, said you know we should 
get a you know group of back then we were just loosely discussing putting six or ten dealers together and getting a number of pages of in AIA or whatever you know mm -hmm. we had back then and doing advertising and getting it out to a broader broader spectrum of, of the public and letting them know that Native American art is what it is it's not it's not restricted to the field it is it is a formal you know field of its own art um, museums are finally now recognizing that but right. we need to do it with people as well and we both deal not just in historic earlier material you know the no you know great 1880s great. and up sure. but we also deal in contemporary you have a lot of contemporary jewelry you collect by some of the great masters and yeah both there, both my hands have yeah i'm sitting, sitting there with it today too <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah no and then there's some, you know as we well know there's some extraordinary artists out there yeah. you know i mean if we're you know we're in the jewelry field yeah we you know there's a number of them the mckee plateros you know the uh richard chavises that are just yeah. absolutely off the, off the chart Jared's yeah another one absolutely <laughs> i'll know. be out at indian market looking at all these guys right stuff. ray scott who i think's unheralded you know no you know known but probably should be known more yeah, yeah. i mean go down the list clearly yeah. yeah all right i guess i'm gonna go do my thing that i've got to go do a show today but thank you for coming in tad anderman now i know the whole thing now everything <laughs> fits into place if I hadn't talked to you, I would have never figured out why you collected all these things, things the way you do. But now I know. Mark, I, great, Mark, I greatly appreciate it. This has been a great experience. Yeah, thank well, you. thank you for taking the time, my friend. All right. Thank you. Go find something. Send it off to Australia. Great success with your shows up here. All right. Very good. Tad Anderman, thank you very much. Art Dealer Diaries. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.